Business over drinks. Business over drinks. This is Dave and Tom. This is business over drinks. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Business Over Drinks. My name is Tung and I'm calling in from Singapore. Good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. My name is David. I'm calling in from Brisbane, Australia. How are you doing? Not too bad, man. We usually say the same thing that we've got a special one here. And I think we kind of do have a special uh, special guest you think? on our podcast. Yeah, I think. I'm not hello, sure. Hello, hello. <laughs> we can say, uh, so we're going to introduce you in a minute, man. So here we go. So um, we've got a former colleague of mine and an all around and I said average, so I wrote down average. I'm going to say all around good guy, uh, Nicholas Chan, and he's hello. been ex- he's been exceeding my expectations pretty much throughout. He keeps on saying hello all the time, breaking my flow. Thanks, Nick. Mm-hmm. So <laughs> uh, Nick is actually the head of digital for APAC uh, at the Hoffman Agency. So if you don't know about the Hoffman Agency, is one of, I think, one of the most recognizable and big uh, PR agencies, digital and uh, PR and digital agencies in the world. So he's the head of digital APAC. Uh, he spent more than half of his uh, Marcom's adventures in, in Shanghai, in China, and was also running the Hoffman Hong Kong office briefly, briefly which is mm-hmm. kind of embarrassing because Nick actually started his PR journey uh, after me. So he's actually technically years wise, a little less than me. So fuck that. Uh, <laughs> he's now based in, uh, in Singapore, but you're in Hong Kong right now, right, Nick? I am in Hong Kong right now. Awesome. Okay. So Nick lied on his bio. Um, and oddly enough, he considers me one of his oldest friends in the industry, which is not saying much because he doesn't have any other friends, but that's cool. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to just jump straight into it, man. So before I go into all your accomplishments and things that you've done, how have you been, by the way? I've been great. Uh, I wish I caught up with you a lot more throughout the years. I think we did catch up here and there. Yeah, uh, yeah we have. After Hill and Norton. So me and Teng Xing met in Hill and Norton, like what, 11 years ago? Ages ago, man. I don't want to, I don't give any dates because it makes me sound really old, dude. I don't give any dates, man. But yeah, probably about 11 years ago, man. So embarrassing. So fucking long ago. Uh, but it yeah, fun, yeah. yeah no, it was funny. It's fun. So yeah, I, I, re- I can barely remember a lot of the stuff about the agency life, but Nick and I worked together then. And then on and off, we've always like, uh, basically our parts are always crossed because the industry is really small. Even in just yeah. APAC, the industry is not that big. So we always kind of cross parts. And so that's kind of cool. So uh, were you were you e- colleagues or was Nick your boss? <laughs> colleagues, no, <laughs> colleagues. Oh, it's all right. Colleagues, yeah. Yeah, I, I was no one's, but I think when we first uh, we were we were fucking junior at that point, Nick. We were uh, so junior. Yeah, I don't think I was anyone's boss. I think I was just basically you're just rubbing feet, making <laughs> coffees. Yeah, just crying. The, the usual stuff, man. It's what junior just junior stuff in agencies do, dude. Uh Nick and every test. agency has like these few dudes. <laughs> I think that me and Teng Xing and I think another colleague named Andrew, like we were like, and Mark, we were like just the, the bros and the dudes. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, no. So yeah, I'm still in touch with Andrew, by the way. So that's yeah. cool. Andrew and I worked together for a long time. Mm. But yeah, no, I mean, I mean, yeah, because I don't know if anyone knows, but when, when we worked in PR, PR is generally a very uh, female dominated industry. So when we worked at Hill and Norton, I still tell people there were about at the peak when I worked there it was about fifty to fifty five consultants, forty five were women. Yeah, and it's everyone like it was the weirdest experience for anyone. True story. Used to it. Yeah, it was. I mean, it was interesting. It was just very estrogen filled, uh, which isn't a bad thing. Just different. So it's anyway, still, it's still very much true now. If you're oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah. just a dude that wants to work in a female dominated environment, come to PR. Oh yeah, my so my my agency basically, I think there are like two guys, me and another guy. Everyone just every, everyone else is like 20 other women, man. It's it's not great. The the gender di- the gender diaspora is not not you, act, you guys not need to do speeches in high schools and they'll you'll get all these guys just starting to enroll in PR <laughs> in university, and then they'll just change the We'll just shift everything. No, nah, man. It's actually a strange phenomena, actually, because um, we've been talking about this. I wouldn't say it's an issue. I would say it's a phenomena quite a bit, right? And, and there, was, there was this survey recently that shows majority of bosses in PR are male, right? Specifically, that article said white male, right? But mm-hmm. they are male. And majority of them, people in the industry are female. So I don't know where this ladies are disappearing off too, right? I'm sure motherhood and things like that plays a part, but uh, it's still quite a weird 
situation. That's true, man. It, you're, you're actually right. I've actually had more male bosses in PR than female bosses in PR, and which is a bit odd. Same, same. Yeah. And considering them, like, where are all these peers that we are working with graduating off to, right? Not all of them will become mothers. So, you know, it's still overwhelmingly strange that this happens. I, I think the test of this is going to actually come down to the fact that are we going to look at the next generation of PR leaders, right? Are they going to be men and women? Because if we're still seeing it's a higher, done, higher, uh, higher uh, ratio to women, by a considerable amount of ratio of women to men. Mm. And now that we're moving towards, I think, more, uh, more parity at least in leadership, are we going to see more female leaders in PR? Or do are women just generally smarter so they leave quicker? And they just go in house, make more money. <laughs> so, yeah, it's interesting point there, right? Are they smarter and thus they left quicker? Maybe. Yeah, ex- exactly, exactly, man. You don't. <laughs> no one, no one seems to understand that PR is very. It's very rare that you get someone who start who starts a career in PR and ends a career in PR, or at least in agency. You kind of move off to something else or you do something different because PR is always a stepping stone or something. So, I mean, it, it's it's a. That's why I like. Like I lasted this long, Nick, you've lasted this long. And just by default, they're like, hey, we've got, we've got 14, 15 years of experience. Everyone else has left. They're like, mm. we, no, no other choice. <laughs> so mm-hmm. like, that's pretty much it, man. Uh, sorry, before we go into, do you guys want to, uh, let's quickly go into what we're drinking. Dave, why don't you start us off with your terrible drink? Yeah, so I'm still trying to finish this bottle that I was drinking from in our previous podcast with Rachel Wong, which is Bombay Sapphire. It's a, it's a drink that I had with me during a belated birthday party in a hotel. And because I spent money on it, I just, I just need to finish it. It's, it's a disappointing drink. I'm very disappointed. <laughs> but there we have it. I'm having it with uh, soda and a uh, slice of lemon. Nice. So I'm having a Karen uh, strong liquor. I have no idea what's in it other than the fact that it seems to be lemon and something else. Probably too high on lemon. So it's pretty good. Bought it at a 7-Eleven, so if you guys are interested, here we go. Nick, you want to tell us what you're drinking? I'm having a beer, an Asahi. Usually, I'm a Asahi black person, mm-hmm. but I could only find this in the fridge, <laughs> and it probably belongs to somebody out there that I didn't ask. <laughs> Nick, you know, don't you worry. Know, Nick, you're the boss, Nick. You can just say like, hey, shut your mouth. <laughs> in the marketing industry, like we pretty much had to live and breathe on alcohol. Just to just to cope with the day. Is that the same with PR? Do you guys do you have like a beer handy just in your cupboard? I think that um yes, we do drink quite a bit, but I do feel like the culture is changing. Yeah. Younger folks that come into the industry don't drink as much. Mm. Um they don't have I'm not to. saying that either or is good or bad, right? I'm just saying that hey, you know, I've seen less drinking in the industry. I think that's a good thing. I, I actually think they don't have to. I mean, uh, and I'll speak about this for myself because I think Nick and I had a different different way of coping with the strain and the hours in, in agencies. But when when we worked in sorry, this is Helen Nolte and Nick and I worked together. Um, I would keep a bottle of uh whiskey or whatever in my in my cupboard and then Every afternoon that was really shitty. So around four o'clock, I'd go for a drink in from the pantry. I take like a sco- Coke or a Sprite or something, drink half of it and fill the other half with, with alcohol and just basically get shit faced till about six o'clock. And then so I'll was carry it, on working oh, just, till like 9 p.m. It was just unlimited, right? In, in your age. In, no, so in I home. bought it. I bought it. Okay. My, my agent, yeah. Helen Norton didn't provide alcohol. Helen Norton was a very stuffy agency. They don't provide out. Al- they didn't provide alcohol. They didn't provide cool stuff. You before I joined, you had to wear like a suit and a tie to work every that. day. Yeah. Before, so this was before I, I, I came in. When I came in, they were like, oh, you can be more casual. Just long sleeve shirt, no need a tie. I'm like, this is not casual. This is really, really <laughs> formal. <laughs> well, that, that was the way that were. like women weren't allowed like open toed shoes and all the stuff. Skirts had to be like an inch below the knee. This, I, we, I, read, the, I read the handbook and I was like, thinking, that, that was a handbook. I, I can yeah. attest to that. It was crazy, man. Agency is like that, that was quite cool. normal for PR back then. And for, this is just a short 10 years for, ago. For, for, for big ones, for big ones, it was. I think a lot of the medium-sized ones, so even re- global medium-sized agencies kind of like um, broke the mold a little bit and said like, hey, we have to start being cooler because we're losing the best people to other industries now. Yeah. yeah. 
And well, that's well, I visited a friend in Saatchi, that advertising agency, and he had a small fridge next to him. It was full of absinthe and just really hard liquor. Oh shit, I remember that. Yeah. yeah. That was a good, yeah. that was a good trip, man. You didn't like it, but it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> I, I think that a lot of agencies, the, the drinking culture is driven by the few figure hits, right? I think that if the boss that runs the office drinks and he has like a little fridge or something, people will be more, be less oh, yeah. shy about joining in the drinks. You seldom yeah. will see that like juniors just start like imbibing shit in the middle of the day if the boss doesn't do it. Like, are you insinuating everyone who, who's, uh, who drinks is an expat in, in Asia? Yeah, man. Like, yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah, so you, you're an, I mean, you and I were expats. You're an expat, too. Man, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a foreign talent, dude. It's different. You're foreign talent. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's a, that's like a negative term, dude. It's very different, mate. <laughs> There's expert and foreign talent. Like, I'm foreign talent. Like, I, um, I, drank, I drank out of sadness. <laughs> Actually, one thing that, the reason that I reached out to you and I really want to talk to you is because I saw that you were just winning, like, you are just winning a bunch of different stuff, man. I'm not angry. I'm just mm -hmm. disappointed with everything and how the awards are. <laughs> but, like, you won, like, you, I think you were selected for the, the Provoke stuff and the Campaign Asia Awards, right? Yeah. Like, man, has has that has that even like has that see, are, these, are these big awards? Are these? Uh... Yeah, in the in the industry, yeah. they're pretty pretty reckon. I mean, there's there are three. I think these are two out of the three. I'm from Mexico, right? Which is um, the third? I think IPRS, I right? IPRS, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah I think that's the one. No, man. So, like, has it changed your life at all? Has anything changed since you announced since you awarded this stuff? I don't think, strictly speaking, this. Well, definitely more people are browsing my, like lurking on LinkedIn, right? Uh, that's, I think, one. That, definitely, there's more people Googling your name just because it was on the publication. Whether it has actually translated into anything concrete, I think not because it's just been, what, it was last, last week or two weeks ago. Um, that said, I'm not... I... I, I've had other awards in the past, right? And when the runway is longer, it definitely pays off. So I, it would be disingenuous for me to say that it doesn't help. It mm -hmm. definitely does. Even though, you know, us in the industry, we know that, hey, you know, uh, awards are not as black and white as you think, right? Uh, yep. But they still work. So it is what it is. Yeah, no, man, I, 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 can't, I can't, I can't deny that. I sim I always make fun of awards until I started to win awards later, mm. and then I stopped making fun of them, and they were awesome. But then I stopped winning them for a while, and then I was like, screw it. But then we started winning again, so I was like, cool. It's a, it's a, it's an up and down thing for me. So I'm not, I'm, I'm not such a hypocrite that I'm just gonna go on after them. But hey, uh, Dave, so give me one second. I got one more follow up from Nick because I actually congratulate you on LinkedIn. And then you told me you didn't even know that you won. You were selected for the 40 under 40 by Campaign Asia. Was it? Was that yeah, just a, I, I, I thought a you were talking the provoke stuff. So no, like, like he he like he genuinely show. said, "What do you mean Campaign Asia?" Because I was like, you know, congrats on the provoke and the Campaign Asia stuff. He was like, "Thanks, man. What do you mean Campaign Asia?" I was like, "Yeah." So it was after Tom messaged me, and then I went to Google it. And I haven't read like emails for the entire day or so. I think it was also emailed out. So I did not realize. And this is like me admitting that I don't read emails for a whole day sometimes. Uh, was it after that that I Googled it that I found out? Dude, I think the campaign issue thing had been out for, like, for a while, man. Like at least two, three days if I'm mistaken. Oh, really? Yeah. So yeah. I mean, I just again, I did not know. I know that there was a nomination, right? So I know that there was an entry sent, but I did not know that. Uh, I have been selected. Oh, can I ask? Can I ask you right though? Just a quick question. Why do you think I wasn't selected, man? Did you submit? No, but still, they should have just. It should have been written in, man. It should have been a write in, right? That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. Should have write in. Yeah, sorry, Dave, man. I took you. I took your spot. You got a question? Yeah. So, how old are you, Nick? I am thirty six <laughs> this year. Eighty five. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah. I fucking, I fucking love these questions. How old are you? Cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite color? No. Uh, <laughs> You're, you're just 36 and you're already the head of digital APAC, Asia Pacific, of, of you know, one of the most prominent PR agencies. It's that's a bit of a feat. And, and uh, I think it's a lot, it's a goal for many people. You know, can you tell us about your journey? How, how did you get to where you are today? 
So how do you, I, how do you climb so fast? Yeah. I, I climb fast. I, I would, i I think that that's also disingenuous to say, like, like I, I do acknowledge that I am quicker than many, uh, but I think that what worked for me was really knowing what I wanted to do. So this question comes up a lot when we interview people, right? Uh, where, yeah, like, hey, uh, so where do you see your career in, right? And they're like, a lot of the answers, I, I wouldn't say they're bad answers, but you can tell that the real answer that they had in their minds was like, you know, it's hard to tell whatever I can get. I actually had a job that I wanted, right? Uh, I think to this realization when I was at my second agency after Hill and Norton, um, and I was working for this guy that had my, uh, his name is Simon, right? And he's one of my mentors and he had my current job description and title. So for the last six, eight years or so, I've been chasing after this. So it was very easy for me because there was something to reach for, right? Um, I would have to say that then, you know, it, 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 gives you, it gives you something very concrete to tell, to make your intentions known to people that make these decisions. And, and as a decision maker myself these days, I have to say that that means, that, that actually matters a lot because when I talk to juniors, same thing, right? A lot of them, they don't know where they want to go. And it's hard for me to then be like, okay, so I guess, I guess I'll give you a promotion, right? But, but it makes it so much easier if they, if they know exactly what they want and then you're able to match what you see versus what they want and then help them on gaps, right? So I, I think that having that target in front of me made it a lot quicker. So do you think that the problem lies with people actually not trying to carve a path for themselves? Or do you think it's a fact that maybe none of us really had a path, but we didn't have proper mentorship or leadership that kind of told us we should be having a path? I, I think it's, it's a, a combination of both. And I'm not afraid to say that um, I wish that some things had been told to me uh, earlier in my career. I oh, think name, that and, I name and shame, man. Name and shame. Who didn't tell you stuff? No, I don't think it's general. It's, <laughs> it's uh, well, it, I mean, in that case, all my mentors, I think, uh, I don't think that they knew better that certain things you had to outright be like, hey, you know what? Maybe if it between the lines, you will get it. But if you don't, this is what's happening. I think like there were things like that where, where uh, it's privy. I, I, I don't even think that it's their job to tell me these things. I, and I'm, I know I'm not being very specific right? Uh, but just use that example uh, that I just gave, right? I mm -hmm. am of the, the opinion that if, if you work with somebody and they tell you exactly what they want to do and where they want to go, it's easier for me to help get them there. Nobody ever came to me, hey, you know, just tell me what you want and we'll see what we can do about it, right? It, it usually became a sort of like a you think, I thought, and then let's both guess sort of a situation. So I think in, in, in the employment world, it is not their responsibility to come and reveal to you that, hey, this is how the, the game is played and this is how the cards are laid out, right? But I, I, I took that lesson away and that's actually what I practice with juniors these days. I, I tell them outright, like, if you don't tell me what you want or, or what you're good at, it's, you're leaving it up to chance for me to sort of get you to where you want to be. Man, you're describing Hill and Knowlton, man. You're describing people's experiences at Hill and Knowlton, at least when, when, when I was there and when we were there. It's a, mm. it, was a, it was a unique type of thing. Mm. Oh, that's good, man. Um, yeah, but okay. I, I, I always want to ask, because you, you kind of, you went from, you basically went to one of the most difficult markets to, to manage. Like, so you, you moved to China. So why did it go? Like, why did you leave Singapore and like, you know, kind of just go, okay, I'm just going to go to the great north and try my, and try my luck there. So I wanted to, I always wanted to work overseas. This is even before I joined Hill and Norton. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember because when, when you're young and dumb, you want to go work for what you enjoy. And I wanted to work at Blizzard, actually. Oh, yeah. yeah. Don't go there, yeah, man. Because that, that's yeah. not now. But, yeah, don't go there, man. <laughs> but uh, I, mean, I mean, growing up, playing games, you wanted to do that. So I, mm -hmm. I think that seeded in me the desire to work uh, overseas. 
Um, so I was always pursuing that, but you know, you don't really know what your options are when you're younger. Even, even now, you know, to a lot of people, this may still be a, a, a mystery. How do you get there, right? Uh, I, I get that question a lot, actually. Okay, how do, you, how do you find a job overseas? I think a lot of people yeah. have this question. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to go overseas. It wasn't particularly China, just somewhere. Um, when, I got the, when I got the opportunity, I think it came back down to the fact that I expressed interest in it. And it was actually kind of dumb because I actually told my... The person that was interviewed. So after Hill and Norton, I interviewed at, at Golin. Mm-hmm. And I actually did tell my the boss at that time, this lady called uh, Christina, that actually my goal is for you to hire me and for me to finish my studies so I can go overseas. Like in hindsight, it was really dumb, right? As a sort of a answer. It's like, hey, you know, I'm just gonna be here till I, I don't want to be here anymore and bye. Yeah. So um, I think expressing that interest really helped me because people knew like if you had a few people that were doing well and you were planning career paths, they at least knew it was an easy decision where to place me. Mm-hmm. There were some people they had to guess and sort of like ask. So that helped a lot. The second thing was when, when I decided to move to China, it wasn't actually the hot and obvious choice as it is now. Uh, I think it was up and coming, but it was still, I, I think the biggest difference is that when I came back from, from China to Singapore, I think in early 2020, pe- people love Chinese culture, Chinese food. There was like mala, this, this mala shit everywhere. Mm-hmm. Five years before that, people were pretty anti-Chinese and China. Oh yeah, for sure. Our sponsor for this podcast is Liquor Loot. So Liquor Loot houses alcohol subscription services, Whiskey Loot and Gin Loot, delivering three premium and hand-selected whiskey and gin tasters from around the world each month. I drooled a little bit when saying that. Yeah, you did. Liquor Loot is a unique tasting subscription business model and isn't just providing 60 ml alcohol samples. They're providing platforms to discover new things about whiskey and gin, which I just did because I'm drinking their classic dry with a twist of lemon. We have a couple of these boxes ourselves. You get three samples of whiskey or gin every month, plus some guides and video content and stuff like that to, to really help you grow as a uh, whiskey or gin or liquid connoisseur, which is somewhat something that I definitely need. Our listeners get a special offer on whiskey. Just head over to our website, businessoverdrinks.com and head over to our sponsor page or even our uh, show notes and then uh, look out for Liquor Loot. Just click on the link and you can check it out. So you get a chance to taste a curated selection of hard to find scotches, single malts and new world whiskeys, including Japanese and American award-winning malts. And remember everyone, drink responsibly, be the good person out of this. All right, Please buddy. don't sue us. <laughs> no, actually really don't sue us. We don't have any money. Come on guys. All right, let's jump straight into it. For sure. So within a, 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 a span of five years, it just became an obvious decision. But when I made that decision, it wasn't, that obvious, yep. um, but I actually offered to go to a few markets as just an exchange. And um, I then chose China because I did not want to come to Hong Kong because Hong Kong is too similar to Singapore as just a yep. market. And it was, it, it is still, but it, it was expensive <laughs> as shit. So I felt that Shanghai would be fun uh, uh, and, and turned, out, turned out it is, right? Of course, the yep. China that, that um, as I was leaving just a short, a year ago, right? I, I think the, the, the work environment is very different from five years yeah. ago when I just landed. Super different. I, I, think, I think people, uh, maybe, maybe quite a few people that don't quite realize the, the lead, the world leader that China has become. And it was it's very quick. Like people don't very seem quick. to realize it was in the course of like two, three years that China basically turned everything upside down. Mm. And they everyone still thinks, looks to the US for innovation and stuff. It's all happening in China. We just don't understand what was happening because they close off a lot of stuff. But yeah, what, why I, did you leave China, Nick? Uh, I left China, I think um, two things. Number one, definitely being a foreigner in China is becoming increasingly difficult. Your, your, your value as a, Teng Xing would like to say, you know, foreign talent is, is uh, depreciating by the day. 
as you, you, China... could, you couldn't speak Mandarin, right? Can you speak, do you speak can, Mandarin can speak, there? Okay, yeah. I can speak Mandarin. I'll give you an example, right? Five years ago when I just went, um, I think the, the, the norm is that people do see that you have something to contribute, you have certain skill sets. Uh, I would have to say standards uh, uh, are usually lower in China. I wouldn't say this across the board. I would say that, you know, just in general, let's just say PR work, right? The quality of work is usually higher uh, uh, let's say in Singapore versus China. So people did feel you have something to contribute uh, maybe creatively, maybe in other ways. But as I was leaving China, there was one meeting in particular that really cemented it for me, which was that the, the, the client actually asked like, hey, I don't think she meant it uh, from a mean perspective, but she did ask like, so you're not Chinese, like what do you have to contribute to this discussion? And that was actually the landscape at, of China mm -hmm. uh, uh, close to 2020, right? Uh, which was that China is becoming more Chinese. They're not becoming more international. And they yep. do not want to be more international. They yep. want yep. you to, they want, I would say as, as far as to say, if you want our business, fuck English. You better learn how to speak Chinese, yep. friend. Yep. So, you know, they are starting to, I think, um, um, they're starting to challenge the, the, the old world order or the status quo. They, they, they do feel, and I'm, I'm not saying that this is not true, not totally true, but they do like the world operates on a set of norms that is unfavorable to them. And it is part of the national agenda to sort of uh, make sure that they get more grounds to speak right, in the world stage. So I think that they are pushing a lot of all the nationalism, all the political tricks, thing. I think it all attributes back to them wanting a more equitable environment to negotiate on the world stage. So I think that that then translates to like you as just a worker in that system, right? As Chinese companies become more uh, uh, powerful, as um, global remits recognizes China as you cannot do without it, half your PNL is gone if you exclude China, right? So then they start shifting headquarters, headquarters to China mm -hmm. or having Chinese, since the largest market is China, it makes sense for the APEC head to be Chinese, yeah. right? So a lot of these decisions, I think, have contributed to China being a more difficult environment to operate in for a foreigner. Or even, you know, like Singaporeans, I would say, are quite international, easy to it's easy for us to blend into any environment. I would say that even for us, it's difficult. It's getting increasingly difficult. Yeah, interesting. No, man, I'm, so like, I'll give some context to back up what Nick said, right? So I've met a lot of uh, Chinese expats over here as well. Like they've been brought down by the companies to basically set, help set up everything and train everyone, right? And they're, they're like, oh yeah, so it's really interesting. Like, you know, I, I always assumed Singapore was basically like China in terms of quality. And they're like, it's not. In just mm -hmm. anything, technology, in, in Marcoms, in anything, man. Like they were, they were just basically, and it wasn't mean. They weren't trying to be rude. They weren't like, mm. they didn't have a superiority complex. It was literally a fact to them. They're like, yeah, mm. the standard is not as high as China. Mm. And it was terrifying at how, at how um, it was so matter of fact, because you know, you can always tell, right? So example, when I speak to some people, I, I'm not going to call out anyone, any specific nationality or whatever it is. But when they talk about what they do, it's like, you know, we're number one, we're the best, you know, they sing the national anthem and stand up and all this shit. In China, it's literally just, it's like an expectation and that you understand that China's ahead of you because they make more money, they're bigger, and they're dominating basically every industry in Asia right now and most of the world. So it's, it's, terrif it's terrifying in that sense. I'm sounding really pro-China, but I'm not. I'm not, I'm not anti-China either. I'm just mostly just kind of terrified about them coming in and taking everything. That's it. That's the honest truth. I'm scared they're going to come in and take everything, man, which is what I don't want. I'm like, please don't do it, China. Or I'm going to learn Chinese real fast. So <laughs> uh, it's, it's terrifying, man, looking at the stuff. Like, you, you live here. And, and Nick, I'm not sure, like, but if you, because you, you haven't been back for a while, right? But if you live here and you meet people from China, man, like, it's different from when you met people from China five years ago. No, oh, it's totally completely different. Completely different. Like the way they view themselves in the world is super yeah. different. And, and good on them, to be honest. Yeah, you know, true. This is actually, it's more of a recognition of where they are, right? So it's not nationalism. It's not really nationalism when they talk about stuff. It's just literally matter of fact discussion about 
how they're so far ahead of everything. And mm. they, they kind of expect a standard that no one else can seem to match it, at least. Right? So actually, I, I would have to say, there is one point that I, 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 I have to sort of use this platform to sort of put out there, right? That not all things, I think that they are far more advanced, but, but doesn't mean it's better. And I'll give you an example, right? I find the, u, the user experience on Taobao, oh, and of course that terrible. then translates to Lazada and Shopee, yeah. fucking terrible. Yeah, so Taobao, what, what's Taobao for anyone? Taobao is basically Alibaba, right? Like e-commerce website. Uh, oh yeah, it's like Amazon biggest. for everyone else outside there. Exactly. But, yeah, but it's, it's, it's bigger. It's, it's I don't bigger think Amazon. that Amazon is much better, but in terms of absolute, like giving you seizures and oh, yeah. in my opinion, a crappy experience, Taobao takes the spot. And all the e-commerce sites, because, I followed, I followed, yeah. Yeah, we, we just, they just followed, right? And doesn't matter whether, well, so you know what is more important, right? Uh, is something that is used by a lot of people and thus a lot of people just sort of go with it. It's just almost like saying that just because they invented a five-wheel rickshaw, that the five-wheel yeah. rickshaw is the fastest in the world, right? So everybody has just gone ahead and made, made it five wheels. So I think that that's actually bad. And, and not everything that I think China uh, uh, has done the best, but definitely most people are using it and that counts for something. Oh, can I, can, I, can, I show you, can I show you what Nick is talking about? So if you can see my screen, right? This is just the homepage of what Shopee looks like. It's just, it's so many things yeah. happening at the same time. I don't know how to use anything. And buying is no longer just like clicking buy. Yeah? They are like, yeah, you know, yeah. in, in, in China, and this has again been brought to Southeast Asia and APEC, right? Like during super, they have like one, one, two, two, so many shopping festivals. Mm. This is again the China sort of- 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12 coming 11, up. 11, 11, right? Yeah. And then they have like, you can't just straight out buy anything anymore. You have to be like, okay, I will, uh, right before double 11, I will order this first and add it to my cart. Right, and then yeah. you know, through some fuckery or something, you'll hopefully be able to get it on double eleven. So there's just so many layers of monetization, and they're yeah. just trying to confuse you, right? Like, so it's terrible. I, I yeah, I think I think they're tapping into something that consumerism is has built. It, it it's grown from being most convenient to now mm. something else. It's it's weird. Like I don't fully understand it, which is irritating to me. But I I, I get where you're coming from. Man. It's mm. so irritating. So Nick, in your experience working with private companies in China, has a is it a myth of government intervention with, with your decisions and things like that? How how impactful was it, you know, in your ex personal experience? Like government intervention in what a private company does? Yeah, like for example, the, the, all over the news about Alibaba. So all, all the all the te all the tech companies basically so now kind of under lockdown. Indeed, the government plays a big part in. I wouldn't say com how companies make decisions. I would say more of uh, how governments, uh, how the country is run or everyday life of citizens, right? And I think that this is not unique to China. Singapore does this as well, but we are not seen in the same lens as China, mm -hmm. right? If we were, you would feel Singapore is just, the Singapore government is just as in entrenched in how uh, com private companies make decisions as China. So I don't think that this is unique to uh, China. We just have to open our eyes and go beyond bias biases to see it. I'll give you an example, right? The whole Huawei thing, right? And background context is that Huawei was put on like an entity list by the US because they feel like Huawei is a government-funded company, right? A government-funded private company and thus, it is being used for nefarious reasons like spy. And, and Huawei is into making 5G equipment for like your telecoms and whatnot. So that's... Now, the US government had a problem with that because uh, a large part of investments in Huawei is indeed from the so-called Chinese government or yeah. in, in connection to that, the sovereign wealth fund of yep. Chinese governments. But if you think about sovereign wealth funds, right? Singapore has huge fucking sovereign wealth fund. We've been doing that for ages. If you look at the shareholders of our telecoms company or even Australia's telecoms company, it is actually the this. Singaporean sovereign wealth fund. Uh, we talk about like uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, 
right? The royal family, they have a sovereign wealth fund. So this is not new to China, right? I think Americans are just used to that, or Westerners are just used to the fact that, oh, private companies means no government investments. Actually, that's not true. Yeah, this is, by the way, sorry, just to, I actually had to Google this, but because I know how big the sovereign wealth fund, I just want to make sure. David, can you guess how big the Chinese sovereign wealth fund is? Is it more than trillions? It is $1.2 trillion. Okay. That's the amount of money that they're investing. They are operating an income of about $120 billion a year. Yeah. That's so It's, it's That's actually very China. normal yeah. for the country to own some of the biggest companies because you know when they were formed when, when they were poor, it was the government that could pull together that money mm. to invest. Same as Singapore. So, you know, it, does that make Singapore just as, you know, authoritarian or whatever you want to call it? Actually, no, right? It's just a new way of doing things, different way of doing things. No, I agree. And I, as someone who lives in Singapore, I just want to make it very clear that I do not agree with anything Nick has just said. Uh, Singapore is awesome. And I would like <laughs> to continue to live here. So, it's cool. anyway, so, so you, know, <laughs> you know, when we were talking about the, the topic of whether the government uh, interferes in how decisions are made, I don't think directly, but you know, working in these companies, you sort of actually working in these countries, you sort of make decisions based on what you read of you know the environment. It's the same in Singapore. I would say it's the same probably in Jakarta, a lot of Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the same in China. It's the same in Hong Kong. So I don't think even American companies are free from this, right? If there's a government agenda, you try to toe the line. No, I agree. I agree, man. I I think that's right. Hey, but I should, I kind of want, okay, I want to talk about PR specifically because I never get to talk to, uh, about PR specifically on this podcast because no one is a PR person, but you are, right? Can you, like, I want to talk to you, let, let's talk shop for like just one question, Dave. So, so forgive me if you basically feel lost, right? Like what, in your, in your opinion, based on what you're seeing in the market right now, what do you think PR companies are doing right and what are they doing wrong? I think what we are doing wrong is the way that we manage talent. And mm -hmm. what I mean by that is we as an as a industry come to the reckoning that our turnover is shit. And I think that ad agencies have the same problem. Mm -hmm. right? So maybe it is not a PR agency problem, but us as an industry, we need to look at this problem seriously because this is just killing us. This is killing all the agencies. It's killing the agency leaders. It is also killing, you know, a lot of people that come in, they may have a good career, but, you know, it fucked up some way because the way that we yeah. treat talent. I think that's what we collectively are doing wrong. I think what the agencies that are doing right <laughs> but I really are like the agencies that, that help <laughs> clients. You really have to think. Well, I had to think, but I, my answer is, is I, I would stand by my answer. The agencies that tell clients to bug off. Well, no, but see, see, that's the thing, right? I'm going to hold you that one. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to question you that one because I think you're always going to find examples of people doing the right thing. And that's, that's not what I'm saying. I'm not saying what are some companies doing right. I'm saying, what are we doing right that you, that you agree with is the right way of doing, because I have, like, I've shared my opinion a thousand times across every platform I can think of. PR is fucking broken as shit right now. It's been yeah, broken since, since you, before you and I started. It was broken. Mm -hmm. We joined a broken industry. We didn't realize it was broken until we actually got, we understood what was going on, right? Anyone I speak to goes like, yeah, but there's nothing we can do. The way we work, like you said, and it, it boils down to the staffing issue as well. It's broken. And that's what causes a high turnover. Like we're over, we're killing ourselves. We're killing where there's no creativity. There's no, there's no longevity in our industry because it's broken, right? Mm. So are we doing anything right at the moment? Because I don't think we are. I, I think you're going to find outliers doing cool stuff, but I don't think as an industry as well, you average, you, you find a medium. I don't think we're doing anything right. And, and but I'm, I'm happy to be proven wrong because I truly believe we are in an amazing industry that's just really messed up at the moment. I think if we look at PR as the primary job of getting clients into media, right? I don't think that that will go further. further. I think that that is 
Yeah. Like 10 years ago, we were trying to figure out fax machines. Teng Ching, if you remember. Yeah. There were fax machines in office. I still don't know how to use a fax machine, man. I'm so glad this died. I'm yeah, never I never used use a fax it. machine. I used it once or twice, man. I fucked up <laughs> so many times. But you know, <laughs> like fast forward 10 years, the media industry has shifted so much. So many of it has died as well. That I think that, you know, that day that you just mentioned is, is already knocking. But mm-hmm. I do feel like there are emerging places in which PR can do better than, than other, uh, uh, let's say, advertising, right? I'll, I'll give an example. Now that the, the, the corporate world is talking more about diversity, inclusion, equity, things like that, I think that's a space in which PR professionals are uniquely positioned to tackle and help shape and help drive mm-hmm. compared mm-hmm. to, let's say, a, a, a ad or marketing guy. Right. Yes. Those are not places in which you want people to smell like, I think that this is marketing. Right. And I think that those are areas in which those are new areas or emerging areas in which we need to own. Yep. No, no, I, I love that answer, man. I, I think you're absolutely right. I, I have one more follow up and then we're going we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna stop talking about PR because I think we're kind of leaving a lot of our listeners out of the loop as well. But I really want to ask you this question though. Do you think, and I'm going to talk about Southeast Asia specifically, so Hong Kong, China, let's leave it out for a minute, right? Do you think that Southeast Asia is anywhere ready to take that leadership role, PR, is ready to take that leadership role in, in shaping the narrative around issues such as what you're talking about? Because, I mean, let's be very fair. We are a follow type. Our region is a follow region. We follow what the trends are. We don't create trends. And where the probably the least sophisticated modern era PR region out there, because I'm I'm not comparing to you like the like um, the African regions or Middle Eastern aspects, which is which is still very much old school, right? Mm-hmm. But where 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 we're still very we're, we're follow type modern era. Do you think we're ready to take that that step forward? Yes, and and I'll say that by first challenging. Uh, y- your in your words, right? That we are a follow region. I think we were a follow region. I think we are to a certain extent following in certain things. I think most markets in Southeast Asia is coming into its own. Let's not talk mm-hmm. about you know a uh, a uh, uh, markets like let's say Burma that obviously has mm-hmm. some stuff to sort out, right? But mm-hmm. if we talk about Thailand, Vietnam, right? Uh, yeah. Indonesia, right? Yeah. I think there are degrees of uh them being more Indonesian or more Vietnamese and less global, but it's yep. happening across the board, right? As yep, yep, yep. finds that GDP, as Thailand has, you know, as Thailand trains all that talent that they no longer need to import. And, and as all these, you know, you no longer, English is no longer that primary language. If yep. you, 10 years ago, clients could come into APEC, help the, the, the program out of Singapore and be like, hey, let's do everything out of Singapore. Now, if you tell me this and clients do come for this, this kind of request, right? We tell them that that won't work. You have yeah. to do what you want in Vietnam, in Vietnam, yep. in, on Vietnam. So I think we are coming to that point where all these markets are flexing their muscles, mm-hmm. right? And global is no longer, like, let, let's be real. When we talk about global, it's US, right? Global is no longer just US, right? Like yep. Asia wants to be that center of you know, that global narrative. Yeah, Asia number one, man. That's that's what that's my mantra. And that's what I share all the time. And, and no, I, I see so I much disagree. of that happening in Southeast Asia, actually. I, I don't I don't disagree. So I, I that's the thing. I don't disagree with you, and I, I think I think you're definitely right in to some extent. Extent. What I'm talking about for me for me what I'm looking at is the speed at which it's going right. Yeah. Because um, I agree with you 100. You cannot have a a regional hub that is only where you do the exact same thing you just replicate you cannot do you yeah you couldn't do that early if you ask me they just yeah. forced it right um but i guess my concern is at least at this point is where it's moving so slowly that it's going to take fight in a, in a in a in a time where disruption happens in 30 days this might take five years to actually see it kind of reach its its peak at least or it, it's a, a good stable amount right right it becomes a norm and that that's my concern because it, man i don't want to wait five years we've been we've been i've been i've been screaming this for the last four years i think four five years 
that we we I was look I saw this coming before right? I wasn't the only one but I think I was the loudest voice at least right I pissed off a lot of people in the industry because I said a lot of shit and then basically they stopped listening to me they told me I was a moron I got a lot of that by the way I loved it I was like come on I, I can smell your 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 lack of ability to adapt this is great right uh, it was blood in the water basically but I, I saw a lot of that happen and. I guess, I mean, I, I don't want to ask you another question about that because I think Dave's going to kill me, but um, I just want to make one last thing, which is I agree with you that the industry is going, in that you're right, the industry is moving in the right direction. I just worry about the, spe the speed and speed. the pace. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your career is very interesting, right? So you're talking, you, you, you touched on it a little bit throughout this entire podcast, but like what's your biggest regret looking back at your career and life so far? Regret is I did not find to move earlier i think mm -hmm. that i would have done a lot more if i would have maybe not to china but moved out of singapore earlier mm -hmm. that would be mm -hmm. because i got so much out of that that few years i was away right yeah uh, that i felt yeah. that if i could have stretched that out and it's obviously easier to do when you're younger right uh, yeah. so I, I would say that that would be my biggest regret not putting your 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 feet to the pedal and trying to figure it out sooner or later, uh, uh, sooner rather than later. Um, that's it. Speaking of corporate world, though, like like probably eighty percent of the people I know don't like the bosses. How would you like in your experience? How do you move up with the ranks as a, as an employee looking to 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 make you know, make a difference? If you can't get along with your boss, do you have any tips? I'm sure you would have experienced a boss you don't necessarily agree with. I have zero experiences with bosses I don't like. I have a lot of experience oh, wow. with clients I don't like. But yeah. I think that I was always blessed in always working with bosses that acted as collaborators. And I think that that is a huge reason why I think that I, I have benefited from all these experiences. Yeah. Like my current boss, I love working with her. Uh, in mm -hmm. fact, I joined my current agency because I wanted to sort of work for her. So I've, I've had, you know, through, through all my, even when I moved to uh, China, you know, I've had great bosses, right? Uh, great in different ways. Not all of them have hard skills to teach you. Some have soft skills to teach you. They have different things to teach you. Uh, and they have different strengths and weaknesses. But I always had a very good collaboration, collaborative spirit going on with my bosses. But mm -hmm. I do have... Um, I've had a lot of clients that I don't get along with. Man, that's that's that's, that's, that's not uncommon, man. That's not and then how do you? I guess from that, I have a few questions for that. Firstly, if you're a boss, like what would what makes a good boss? But secondly, if you, I guess clients is keeping clients with happy is still important for your job, right? Uh, your job security. I'm I'm assuming. How do you put up with that? You just bend over, take it. So the, the first question, right, on, on being a good boss, I don't think I found the formula. I generally sort of, uh, it's easy to say treat people how you would like to be treated, but it's actually hard to practice. So I just try to do as much as I can in that direction. Trying to sort of uh, whatever was not accorded to me that I felt should have, that would have made my life easier, I give to my juniors. That's my way of sort of like fixing what I did not get. So those two things, I think, helps me with, I think, managing people and teams. The second thing is with clients, not much you can do, right? We choose to work. I have to remember that I choose to work in an agency. I can go to a client side and, mm. and do the opposite, right? But, but with every client that I work with that, you know, sometimes it's not that they are not brilliant. They there may be brilliant. They, them, there are brilliant clients that maybe they are just assholes, right? Or there are, but more likely, usually, like in my opinion, uh, from a place that they do not have just as much. I wouldn't say experience, but they haven't seen as much as you, just because they are a mono brand, and I easily work. A year in an agency would easily sort of trump that experience in internally, right? Because they brand I would have worked. Oh, you you said brand. you said it, Nick. You said it. You said it. one year of solid work in the agency 
is really, really powerful compared to like in-house. People have no idea. If you survive a hard day, your, your fact that if you survived your first year in Helen Norton at, at, at when we started, right? You could work in you could work in any company. It wasn't really a problem. So I would I would sort of like uh, uh uh just this is maybe an unpopular opinion, but you know I have seen a lot of agency folks move in house and survive. I seldom see house folks come to agency and and it works out. Some do, most don't. Oh me, that, that's not an unpopular opinion. That's a that's a that's a true opinion though. Like it's different, right? Because because agency is kind of trial by fire. In and again. This is not talking about smarts or anything, right? Because you're actually smarter if you get paid more and you, your job isn't as fucking difficult. Agency people, yeah, and I, I'll say this as an agency, agency lifer, right? It's stupid. Like you pick a fucking hard job that doesn't really pay you that much and you had to fucking put up with bullshit from clients, <laughs> from, from stakeholders, from everyone, right? And... Then someone, then other ones, you're like, oh, this client's an asshole. But you're like, you're probably getting paid about 40, 50% more than me, or maybe double, who knows? And you, you get go stopped. home at, yeah, you go, you get stuck, you go home at 6, 6 30 at the latest. You complain about the 6 30 time. I'm here at midnight. So fuck you. <laughs> uh, you know, it's true. It's true. That's how it really was for, for me, at least. And I, I'm only going to talk about myself. You know, like for me, I saw a lot of that. And I was like, why am I such an idiot? So I've actually been, I worked in-house as well a couple of times. And I was like, I understand why I'm going back to agency. Because I'm like... Because you like the beating. Kind of, I'm a masochist. But I also feel like you're, you're slowly, your creativity and your, the way, who you are as a person is slowly dying in-house. Sometimes, not all the time. This is not a thing for in-house in total, in, 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 as a whole. But your, your creativity dies a little bit when you go in-house sometimes, for me at least. So I felt like I was kind of losing myself a little bit. So I, I always went back to agency, man. So, I mean, for that, for that, this conversation to come full, it, it, how I look at it, I chose to do this to myself. If you choose to go and watch something that you know the contents of, you chose to watch it and scar yourself. Nobody made you watch it. So I choose to be an agency. So, you know, if I meet clients that I don't like or I don't totally agree with, a job is a job. So it doesn't bother me that much anymore. Like you that's, learn that's from correct. them, just yeah. learn what you do not want from yourself from them, right? That's the yeah. best thing you can take mm-hmm. away from it. No, that's really cool, man. I, I think that's a really good way of looking at it. And I think that's something a lot of people need to kind of take into account as well, because you, you, you kind of chose to do what you want to do mm. at any mm. position. And I say this knowing full well, I run an agency that you can choose to leave at the same time if you don't want it anymore. And you should. You, if you don't like it, you should leave. Yeah. And that's not a that's not a threat. That's more like, yo, dude, that's the smartest thing for you to leave, yeah. right? Yo, uh, listen, man. What we usually do though is because we always want we always want to find something tangible to kind of give our listeners, right? Um, do you do you read a lot of business books or anything that you like? Or do you have any life lessons, like b- three maybe, like or a couple of big life lessons that you think that people can benefit from? Uh, I, the, the, the book that I read most recently, well, there are two things that caught my eye recently. Uh, the first one, I can't remember exactly the name of it, but it's called something like the pre the Peter principle or something like that. And it was actually interesting because it was on management and it says that the theory is something like that. Um, people go on to a job, right? Well, we're talking about promotions, right? You're promoted to a job and you keep getting promotions until you're not enough to go to the, the next stage. By that principle, right, the, 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 the catch-22 is, technically speaking, if that is true across the corporate world, everybody in their current job is not qualified for their job. Or is not qualified for the next job, right? So they're actually bad at their jobs, right? Because if you are then good at your job, you'll go to the next stage. So if you're at your current level, it means you were not good enough to go to the next, right? So, so that sort of catch-22 concept was interesting to me. So how do you spell it? P the Peter principle is it? People people principle. People P E T E R. Peter P E T E R the the name Peter. Let me just as we talk, maybe I will just quickly bring up. Oh yeah yeah, it is called the Peter principle, right? All right, we're gonna. It's a concept in management, right, which observes that people in a hierarchy tend to rise a level of respective incompetence. Man, Peter sounds like a real douchebag, man. (laughs) 
Is it was this a book or did you just read it? Read, read I read it in uh I read it on Reddit actually, believe it or not. Oh nice. We were talking, there was a thread talking about management and how uh Singapore small businesses in Singapore are just full of assholes and some of this concept up. And I reading into it. Nice man. Okay, cool. That's really interesting. Yeah. You you said that you you also read a couple of books, right? That were really interesting. Or you read a book or so? This the other book that I would recommend is this one. It's it's a fairly popular book called Thinking Fast and Slow. Um, mm-hmm. and it's that's a big good. read. Sorry, that's a heavy read. Good stuff. Yeah, yeah. It it was. I read it like some chapters. I had to read it two or three times because I just lost concentration reading through it. And some of them are science principles, but um, it was really helpful to me because I think that. I have, people have told me I have smart aleck syndrome. So I like to assume a lot. And because <laughs> I'm so cocksure and confident about, you know, my decisions and how I see things, right? So they're, they're probably right. And, and um, people that make decisions quickly or use a lot of assumptions, we make uh, uh, wrong decisions all the time. So yep. thinking fast and slow helps you understand why people that make mistakes make those mistakes and it's actually in this system one and system two of your brain and how it functions right so i think that people that want to make less mistakes making decisions should read at least the first five chapters of or at least the wikipedia episode because you probably get everything from that nice man now we're going to put in our book recommendation so we have a we have a list of book recommendations that we send out to our listeners and we have on our website so we'll, we'll put it there but that's really cool any other books that were really interesting? I can't remember the name, but there was one on generalist versus specialist. It was written, the first chapter I remember on like, he used the example of chess masters. Why are chess masters... Do you remember the author? Joel Kinnaman or something. Let me just quickly search. So for anyone looking for these book recommendations, you just go to businessoverdrinks.com forward slash books. And you can also see our show notes with Nick at businessoverdrinks.com. That book is called Range, Why Generalists Triumph in a Specialized World. Range, got it. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Thanks, man. I haven't heard of that one. Yeah, well, it's, called, we'll... it's by David Epstein, not to be confused with the pedophile. The other Epstein. <laughs> I, I really like how you said his name was Joel Kinnaman. <laughs> David, David Epstein. All right, very cool, man. Like, I just really like how you just like name really random people. But if you could go back and chat to a 21 year old you, you know, what's the one piece of us you'd give you? Go overseas. Yeah. Please. Oh, that's the same thing. Yeah. Okay. I get go it. Overseas. No, so yeah, that was a, that was I mean, a big I mean, thing go, for you. It was a big thing for for me, obviously for Tung as well, like go, moving to Singapore for a bit, that, that completely changed my life. I don't mm. know for the better, but it's, it's, it's definitely... I changed your life, man. I, mean, I don't know. I definitely don't Multiple know ways, right? Social circles, the way you view things, so uh, mm. personal responsibility. Just, just the fact that I think people don't talk about this enough, right? When they talk about experiences moving overseas, the anonymity is what enables a lot of things. The feeling like nobody knows who you are exactly. I'm not saying that you become like some evil mastermind or something, right? But the fact that nobody conceived assumptions about who you are as a person allows you to become the person you want to try to be very easily, right? Because in, in a place like this, like let's say I, I know Teng Sheng, right? Uh, and, and everything I do has to sort of uh, live up to what Teng Sheng knows about me. Mm. And I think that that is, uh, that is uh, a, a sort of a barrier in itself, even though it's self-inflicted. And knowing that nobody knows you or gives a shit about you in another country enables, just that change in thinking has enabled a lot of things in me. That's a really good point, man. Especially Asians who, who are really influenced by the opinions of their mm. parents, right? Yes. Yeah. And others, right? Parents and others. Thank you. Say thanks, everyone, for listening. Uh, don't forget to follow us on Facebook, YouTube, Instagram. Where else? Uh, LinkedIn. Only fans. Only, only fans. And comment, like. It's, it's only we get great guests, guests like Nick in. So please show your support. Thank you, everyone who's, who's been following us this far. Thank you for all the kind words you've been sending us. So 
for any show notes and and things that Nick has mentioned today, head over to businessdrinks.com. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Hey, everyone. We really hope you enjoy the episode. But before you go, don't do it. Please don't leave me. We Because we have a really important announcement. It's a very quick, brief announcement, but it's very important. And it's this. The world is ending. The zombies are going to take over. The vaccine that you've all heard about is actually a killer zombie vaccine. And if you've seen iRobot, if you've seen World War Z, World War Z, Z, whatever it's called, it's going to happen. But all seriousness. QAnon, so, QAnon. Oh, sorry. Okay. QAnon? Yeah. In all seriousness, in serious, ugh, I'm stuttering. But anyway, in all seriousness, though, we like to talk about a sponsor, Liquor Loot. So Liquor Loot is an amazing company, so we're really happy to have them on board. They house alcohol subscription services, Whiskey Loot and Gin Loot, and they deliver three premium and hand-selected whiskey and gin tasters from around the world each month. So guys, this isn't just your standard, you know, hey, subscription business model where you just get three uh, tasters and that's it. They're actually a platform for you to discover new gins and whiskeys, which is what I just did with my classic dry it's really cool the twist of lemon in there and i've been drinking pretty much since 1 p.m yeah it's, it's, it's 100 percent true and, and drink responsibly but anyway uh Tung is very right about that you know Tung and i are very picky about who we choose to sponsor our posts and, and our podcasts so we're really happy to have liquor loot on board we got a box in the mail from liquor loot and it's pretty much like receiving an Apple product and opening it. it. It's you open it and you get a beautiful selection of either whiskeys or gins, as you can see here. And I don't have it here with me. Also, if you're watching on YouTube, by the way, you'll be able to see this. If you're listening on a podcast, just check out our website to see some photos and so forth, or a link to the website to, to Lickaloot website. Um, not only do you get these three samples, you get guides and on what they're about, the tasting. Uh, how to prepare them, uh, what their flavor profiles are like. And the, the whole intention of it is that you'll grow and mature as a gin or whiskey connoisseur over time. And it's, it's a really beautiful concept. All right. Thanks, Dave. Your, your energy is infectious. That, <laughs> that was sarcasm, man. You, you sounded like you were dead. Right. So, <laughs> um, so like zombie we virus, wouldn't, we wouldn't be, a, we wouldn't be a podcast with our listeners and we wouldn't have sponsors with our listeners. So our listeners get a special offer on whiskey at whiskey from whiskey loot. So, so just head over to our website, businessoverdrinks.com and head over to our sponsorship page or even our show notes page where we'll actually put a link to liquor loot. Just click on that link and then check it out. You'll be able to get a, you'll be able to chance to get a, a taste of a curated selection of hard fine scotches, single malts, and new world whiskeys, including Japanese and American ones. I actually, they're all award winning. Most of them are award winning, actually. So it's kind of cool. Uh, I prefer the Japanese ones personally because I think they do better whiskey than the Americans. So here we go. Uh, head over to businessoverdrinks.com, click on a sponsorship section, and look out for Likalu. And remember, everyone, Drink responsibly, don't be like Tung, and do not sue us at whatsoever.